What is up, Ewa Crew? Not every mystery comes with the satisfaction of closure, but today we're going to explore 10 missing person cases that were eventually solved. Number 10. Gavin Smith Gavin Smith was once an actor, stuntman, and high-level studio executive with the 20th Century Fox. He was a popular and successful guy with a great career and a past as a college basketball star, and his home life with a loving wife and three athletic sons seemed to be everything he could ask for at least on the surface. In reality, Smith's marriage wasn't doing so hot and he had begun having extramarital affairs with a woman named Chandrika Cade Creech. At the time of his disappearance on May 1st in 2012, Gavin was staying with a friend to get a break from his decaying marriage. He left sometime that night supposedly to run an errand and told his friend that he'd be back soon. Gavin was actually headed to meet Chandrika. Unfortunately for Gavin, this quick hookup turned out to be more than he had bargained for. Shandrika's husband, John Creech, had installed tracking software on her phone and caught her with Gavin while the two were making out in his truck. John Creech was a convicted felon, a known drug dealer, and an avid bodybuilder. And when he saw his wife with Gavin Smith, he decided to give him a beating he would never forget. In his rage, Creech beat Smith over and over, pummeling him relentlessly. By the time Creech stopped to catch his breath, it was already too late. A stunned Shandrika checked Gavin's pulse, but she couldn't feel his heartbeat anymore. Gavin Smith was dead. Smith obviously never returned home to his friend's place that night, and he never picked up his kids to take him to school the next day. His family reported him missing, and the local police force scoured the town of Oak Park, California. For nearly six months, they held out hope that Gavin would be found. When Gavin and Shandrika's fair came to light, she was questioned, but revealed nothing helpful. It was enough, however, to make Gavin's family suspicious of John Creech. Gavin's sons, convinced that Creech was holding their father hostage, actually went to his house to beg for their dad's life. Creech was completely taken aback by the nerve of the stunt and cryptically told the boys that he had just saved their father's life by coming to him. The boys left feeling hopeful, but as the months passed, that hope began to dim. On October 26th of 2014, Gavin's body was discovered, and the details of the case finally began to unfold. The prosecution was able to put together an airtight case in the trial of John Creech, but in a surprise twist, the jury found him not guilty on the charges of murder and instead voted to convict him of voluntary manslaughter. This left law enforcement officials, including the judge, completely baffled, but it has since been speculated that the jury's decision was impacted by the fact that John Creech had warned Smith to stay away from his wife prior to finding them together that night. It's believed that some members of the jury thought that Creech had acted in a moment of passion after being betrayed by his wife, while others simply thought Smith should have taken the warning more seriously instead of continuing the affair. Number 9. Charles Bothell Charlie was only 12 years old when he went missing in June of 2014. The search lasted for 11 days after his father and stepmother reported him as a missing person and involved a huge police presence, including K-9 units and the FBI who scoured his home and the surrounding neighborhood. Charlie's parents took the search door to door and even on national television, pleading for any information on their missing child. The two grieving parents had the entire nation convinced that they were desperately searching for their son, until polygraph results from a police interview with Charles Sr. came back as inconclusive. And, you know, we did everything that we could to help my son, and to this, um, this is just, I mean, it's, uh, it's a tragedy, so. Suspicion grew among law enforcement agencies that Charlie had been murdered, until, miraculously, Charlie was found alive in the home's basement. Charles Sr. was in a live interview with the popular journalist Nancy Grace when his son was found. The interview was interrupted live on air when Nancy presented him with the news that his son had in fact been just found in their own home moments prior. Well, Charlie, we are getting reports that your son has been found in your basement. Sir? Mr. Bothell, are you... Are what? You Charles Sr. appeared to be shocked as he faced the nation, but suspicions were only growing. Police found evidence that Charlie had been severely by his father and stepmother, and that they had staged his disappearance, keeping him in the basement. 
Among other things, it was revealed that they had forced their 12-year-old son to perform grueling workouts, which they timed. He was also homeschooled, so there had been no escape from the heartbreaking conditions he faced at home. After he was found, Charlie was removed from the home and sent to live with relatives. Charles Sr. and his wife later pled guilty. The case had heads spinning among the police, the media, and concerned onlookers across the country. But in the end, everyone was just glad that Charlie was alive and that he had finally been able to escape his cruel upbringing. Number eight, Colin Finnerty. Colin Finnerty was a quarterback for the Baltimore Ravens and later the Denver Broncos. Following a decade-long career in football for which he had received many awards, Finnerty decided to settle down near his hometown of Brighton, Michigan with his wife and two young children. He got a job at an energy solutions company and prioritized spending time with his family. On Memorial Day weekend of 2013, Finnerty went on a fishing trip to the Baldwin River about an hour from his home. Finnerty, along with his brother-in-law and father-in-law, had already set up their campsite when Finnerty decided to go on a short trip on the river in his small fishing boat. According to the plan, he was supposed to meet back up with his in-laws a little while later, but he never showed up. Before his disappearance, Cole and Finnerty had been acting very strangely. He hadn't been sleeping well and had started to become noticeably paranoid. Some of this has been attributed to the fact that he had suffered many injuries over his football career and had been taking heavy painkillers to help him deal with the pain. In the moments before his disappearance, Finnerty made panic phone calls to both his wife and his brother-in-law. He told them that he had gotten lost and claimed to have seen two men in the woods. He felt like he was being followed and seemed to be in extreme distress. Finnerty's body was found two days after his disappearance, about a mile away from where his in-laws had parted ways with him at the river. His fans, family, and the community were all devastated, having held out hope that he was still alive. An autopsy revealed that Finnerty had died of pneumonia after inhaling his own vomit. It was also discovered that Finnerty had developed a degenerative brain condition which, in combination with his medications he was taking, had caused him to become disoriented and experience hallucinations. It was this terrible combination that was believed to have caused his strange behavior and subsequent death. Number seven, Mark Sanford. Mark Sanford served as a governor of South Carolina from 2003 to 2011. In June of 2009, in the middle of his second term as governor, the entire nation was shocked to find out that he had suddenly disappeared without a trace. News teams had tried to get in contact with the governor, but they started getting vague responses from his office's representatives. Their answers about the governor's whereabouts were vague and inconsistent, but it became clear that no one had seen the governor in several days. Eventually, members of his office told the press that he had gone on a hiking trip along the Appalachian Trail and that he would be back in a few days. Media outlets had serious doubts about the legitimacy of this alibi and continued to speculate about the strange lack of transparency surrounding the governor's whereabouts. It quickly became widely believed that something had happened to him, but no one was sure about the details. Six months prior to his disappearance, Sanford had fallen prey to an email hacking. Personal emails were leaked, which revealed his relationship with his mistress to the public. Several days into his disappearance, journalists turned back to the emails to look for any potential clues to the governor's whereabouts. Sanford's mistress lived in Argentina, so they began looking at flights between South Carolina and Argentina in an attempt to find out if Sanford had been on any of those flights since his disappearance. Reporters staked out the local airport on the day that the governor's staff had said he would return and, sure enough, they watched as he disembarked a plane that had just come in from Argentina. The governor's disappearance had been a poorly planned cover-up for his extramarital affairs. This was a whole lot more than a simple affair, but it's a love story. Despite the bad press that accompanied this scandal, Sanford finished out his second term as a governor of South Carolina and continued his career in politics afterwards. Number six, Patrick McDermott. Patrick McDermott, the once-on-again, off-again boyfriend of actress Olivia Newton-John, was working as a cameraman in Los Angeles when he disappeared on June 30th, 2005. That day, he set out on a fishing boat from the port of Los Angeles, intending to head out on an overnight fishing trip. No one seemed to notice that he was gone until a week later, when he never showed up for a family gathering. The investigation into his disappearance was messy, to put it mildly. 
there were a bunch of conflicting reports from the crew members and other passengers on the boat about whether he had been seen after getting off the boat or not. But investigators ultimately determined that Patrick McDermott had most likely drowned. The case was further complicated by the fact that McDermott had been accruing a mountain of debt, including a large amount of child support he owed his ex-wife. The case quickly captured widespread media attention because of McDermott's previous ties to Olivia Newton-John, and the story was featured on America's Most Wanted, Dateline NBC, and various other popular primetime news shows. Years after his disappearance, it was revealed that Olivia Newton-John had actually hired private investigators to try and uncover the truth about what happened to the missing McDermott. Even though the police had officially closed the case and declared McDermott as having died by drowning, there were many reports that he had been located in 2009, alive and well in Mexico. Officially, McDermott is still considered to be dead, but the results of various private investigations into the case led many to believe that he faked his own death so that he could escape the country, leaving his debts behind. Olivia Newton-John herself has commented on the situation, saying that she doesn't think anyone will ever know what happened for sure. Number 5. Amanda Eller Amanda was a yoga instructor and physical therapist who went hiking on the Hawaiian island of Maui in 2019. Her trip was supposed to be short, only three miles, but the location was surrounded by a forest so dense that locals had to carry machetes to clear vegetation when they passed through. Amanda stepped off the path for a break but got confused on her way back. She had left her cell phone in her car, and with no way to call for help, she was forced to keep walking further and further and hope that she would eventually find her way back to her vehicle. Meanwhile, Eller's family had started to get extremely worried. They reported her missing when she failed to come home after her hike, and they were able to organize a search party that eventually found her car on the side of the road, with all of her things still inside. Suspicion grew that Amanda might have been attacked or abducted, and her family put together a $50,000 reward for any information on her disappearance. Amanda, who had somehow managed to survive for 17 days in the wilderness, was starved and dehydrated. She had fallen more than 20 feet off a cliff and broken her leg, but she just kept going. Finally, by some miracle, she was able to flag down a passing helicopter. In a strange coincidence, she was rescued on the same day that her family announced the reward money in a desperate attempt to find any possible leads. She was rescued as soon as the two men in the helicopter caught sight of her and was able to reunite with her family and make a full recovery. And you guys like showed up hard. Like this is like true aloha. And I've lived here for four years and I've never experienced anything like this. Number four, Azaria Chamberlain. In August of 1980, Lindy and Michael Chamberlain took their two-month-old baby camping at a popular spot in Northern Australia. During the night, a dingo, which is a type of Australian wild dog that's similar to a coyote, broke into the couple's tent and grabbed the baby in its mouth before retreating into the surrounding wilderness. The traumatized couple reported the event to the police, who didn't take them seriously at all. The Australian media, however, latched onto the story popularizing the phrase, a dingo ate my baby in reference to the case. No one wanted to believe that the wildly common dingoes were capable of stealing a baby, instead believing that the baby was missing and that Lindy and Michael were involved. Lindy Chamberlain was tried and convicted of murdering her daughter and served over three years in prison as the world mocked her. After the trial, everyone was convinced that she had murdered her baby and invented the dingo to cover up her cruel actions. Lindy was finally set free after a hiker fell to his death in the same area where her daughter had been taken and led investigators to a startling discovery. While police were searching for his body, they found Azaria's jacket in a dingo lair. Lindy and Michael had been telling the truth, an innocent mother had been sentenced. While it wouldn't bring their daughter back or make up for everything Lindy had been forced to endure, the couple did receive an apology from the Australian government as well as a settlement check for over $1.3 million. The case forced Australian media and police teams alike to reevaluate the way they handled investigations and is still one of the most well-known missing person cases in the country's history. Number 3. Timothy White On February 13, 1980, five-year-old Timmy was playing in his parents' front yard in the small California town of Ukiah when he vanished without a trace. 
His parents were devastated, but a few weeks later, their son was found thanks to the help of another kidnapping victim, 14-year-old Stephen Stainer. After his return, police discovered that Timmy had been kidnapped by a man named Kenneth Parnell. Parnell had abducted other children as well, including Stainer. Stephen had been abducted when he was seven years old and had been held prisoner for seven years before Timmy was also taken. Stephen had accepted his fate over the years, but when he saw that the same thing was happening to little Timmy, he was inspired to save them both from their captor's cruelty. A few weeks after Timmy was abducted, Stephen was able to escape with a small child while Parnell was at work. He walked with Timmy for miles until they were able to hitch a ride with a truck driver who was passing through the area on a delivery. Stephen was trying to get Timmy home, but Timmy, being only five years old, couldn't remember where he lived. Luckily, they were able to find the police station after the truck driver dropped them off in town and the two were finally able to go home. Good morning, uh, Stephen and Mr. and Mrs. Stainer. And Stephen, how does it feel to be home? Feels great. Did you remember your parents well? Um, they didn't change that much. Uh, I, I recognized them when I got out of the car. What about your brothers and sisters? Uh, they changed a lot. I never recognized either one of them. Their captor was sentenced to prison, and Timmy and Stephen stayed in contact for years afterward. When Stephen died in 1989 after a motorcycle accident, Timmy, who was a teenager by then, proudly served as a pallbearer. He carried Stephen's casket to his final resting place and said goodbye to the boy who had saved his life. Number two, Lawrence Joseph Bader. Back in 1957, Larry Bader was your average everyday American guy from Akron, Ohio. He was married with three children and his wife, Mary Lou Knapp, was pregnant with their fourth baby. Larry worked as a salesman for Reynolds Metal Corporation, which is still a household name today because of their famous tinfoil wrap. One day, Larry decided to go on a fishing trip to get some much needed rest and relaxation before the birth of his newest child. He rented a boat, kissed his wife goodbye, and set out for Lake Erie. Larry was supposed to be gone fishing for a couple of days, but that night there was a huge storm in the area. His boat, which had sustained some minor damages, was found the next day, but Larry was nowhere to be seen. Years passed and he was pronounced dead. Larry's story goes much deeper than that though, because four days after his disappearance, a man named Fritz Johnson began making a name for himself in Omaha, Nebraska. Fritz was part of a publicity stunt to raise money for children with polio by sitting atop a flagpole for a whole month. The move made Fritz wildly popular with the locals. He ended up working as a bartender, radio announcer, and television sports director in the local area over the following years. He was known for his flamboyant extravagance and quickly became a local celebrity. Fritz finally decided to settle down in 1961 when he married a woman named Nancy Zimmer. Fritz and the missing Larry Bader shared a passion for professional archery and in 1965, Fritz and Nancy attended a tournament in Chicago, Illinois. The family of Larry Bader, who had been missing for seven years at that point, was also at the tournament and they were in for the shock of their lives when they saw Fritz Johnson and recognized him as Larry Bader. Fritz, aka Larry, was brought in for fingerprinting and it was confirmed that they were one and the same. Larry was examined by an entire team of psychiatrists for 10 days to find out what happened to him and why he seemed to have no memory of his life as Larry Bader. The psychiatrists believed that he really did have amnesia, but the case was complicated by the fact that Larry Bader had been in a lot of debt and was being pursued by the IRS for money he owed them. He also had a new baby on the way when he vanished, one that he definitely couldn't afford. Since his disappearance though, Larry had undergone surgery to remove a brain tumor, which the doctors believed could have contributed to his amnesia. No one could ever really be sure whether Larry Bader really had forgotten his old life when he survived the storm in his fishing boat, or whether he had simply used the whole thing as an excuse to escape a life that was filled with debt and responsibility to become the more successful and exciting Fritz Johnson. Whatever the case, Larry Bader had finally been found and this could not have been worse for his abandoned first wife. You see, after Larry had been pronounced dead, she had been left alone to care for their four children. 
She had collected Larry's life insurance and a pension to keep her and her kids afloat, which would now all have to be repaid. She had also just been proposed to by a new man, but since she was Catholic, she was forced to turn down the proposal after finding out that her husband was still alive. Despite Mary Lou's choice, Larry Bader stayed with his new wife, Nancy, continuing to live as Fritz Johnson until his death one year later in 1966. Number 1. Shoichi Yokoi Shoichi was born in the small town of Sori, in the Japanese countryside of the Aichi Prefecture. He was apprenticed to a tailor until 1941, when he was drafted into the Imperial Japanese Army at 26 years old to fight in the Second World War. Suichi started out as an infantry soldier stationed in northern China, and after two years of service, he was promoted to the rank of sergeant and transferred to the island of Guam in 1943. One year later, American soldiers managed to take control of the island in what would later be called the Battle of Guam. Having lost the battle, Soichi was forced to retreat into the jungle with nine other soldiers. He was eventually separated from the others and spent the last eight years of his disappearance in complete isolation. He hunted his food and used plants he had found around the jungle to make himself new clothes, bedding, and other essential supplies. He made his new home in a cave hidden deep in the jungle floor, which he reinforced with bamboo poles so it wouldn't cave in on him. Back in Japan, Suichi was assumed to have died in the Battle of Guam, but he had actually survived in the jungle for 28 years, long after the war had ended. In 1972, he was finally found by two local fishermen in a crazy coincidence. When he saw the two men, Suichi became afraid for his life and he attacked them, but he was weak from surviving such harsh conditions for so many years. The two fishermen were easily able to overpower and apprehend him. Still terrified but powerless to stop what was happening, Suichi was dragged back to a home in the village where he and the men ate some piping hot soup on their way to visit the local commissioner. Suichi probably thought he was dreaming at that point, but he was finally questioned by the commissioner and sent back home to Japan after surviving for nearly three decades alone in the jungle. He ended up becoming a minor celebrity after his return and wrote multiple books about his experience. Let us know what you think of these cases in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. A playlist is going to pop up right now with more videos you'll love. See you guys next time.